It's my pleasure to introduce Dana Peer from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where she's the chair and professor in computational and systems biology. She is actually one of the leading researchers in this uh, field of computational biology in the world. She did her PhD in computer science at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, was then a postdoc at Harvard um, Medical School, and is now, as, as I said, at Memorial Sloan um, Kettering, one of the, the leading cancer research centers in the world. She has won uh, a large number of prizes and awards for her work. I highlight uh, two from, from the bioinformatics uh, side, the ICB Overton Prize for outstanding work by a young researcher in, in computational biology. And I saw last week uh, she was named an ICB Fellow for her continued contributions to the field. So we congratulate you on that. And uh, we congratulate ourselves on having you here to tell us about machine learning and its role in single cell biology. So thanks uh, for inviting me. And I'm going to uh, do something both completely different from, from the previous very deductive and uh, you know, methodological talk, as well as very different from the talk that uh, Fabian gave this morning. I coordinated a bit with him. So while I was sound asleep, I sort of know what he told you. Um, so. You know, I know that right now uh, machine learning means uh, AI, but uh, for me, actually, you know, in the field of single cell biology, um, it's not the best approach. So I'm really interested in, in understanding biology, particularly understanding cells and tissues and how they work and how they develop and how they respond to biology. And one might ask, well, how does this uh, relate to biomedicine? And in biomedicine, a lot of the problems certainly in the machine learning field and in the comp computer science field where people are comfortable, uh, there's a lot of classification. Will you respond or, or not respond to a therapy? Or you know, finding biomarkers. Can we take a small number of biomarkers that we can measure in a patient so that we can feed them to our favorite uh, classification approach? Basically, these are very powerful and, and, and very important. It, it tells the patient what medicine we should give them and, what are their chances of responding? But in, in cancer, which is you know, my passion and field of research, we're in a situation where there's just too many people where the answer is, we don't have a good drug for you. Uh, we have nothing for you. Your prognosis is, is horrible. There's a lot of people which we can help and, and, and the field is making progress. But my goal and passion is actually to be able to find new drugs and new therapeutic approaches and my strong belief is that the way to do that is to really understand the underlying biology. And that's what I'm gonna focus on. And rather than give a very deductible talk, I'm gonna you know, give you a lot of vignettes about sort of my philosophy and, and some things that are important that are often neglected. So when I started, I started as a computer scientist and, and, and viewed cells as little computers that need to you know, um, get the input from their environment and make decisions, are they gonna proliferate? Are going to differentiate this, that uh, fate or the other? Are they going to respond to a signal such as activation or a stress response? And basically rather than transistors and wires, uh, the, the computing uh, devices of this um, computer are, are molecules. So, so way back, you know, before single cell was, was a phase in a fad, even based on just uh, multicolor flow cytometry, uh, we took the approach that if a cell is a computer and if we can um, measure some of its molecules in a multiplex fashion and sort of observe a lot of different cells and what they're computing, we can actually try and learn the computation uh, directly by, by looking for statistical dependencies between molecules and the data. And you know, the, 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 the pretty naive approach using you know, vanilla Bayesian networks worked surprisingly well. So a data set that we could measure in a single afternoon and you know, run a minute on a computer using, you know, fairly vanilla Bayesian network circa 1990s, actually recapitulated two decades of biochemistry uh, correctly with very little error, and even predicted sort of novel interactions between these classical well-studied uh, signaling proteins um, that were later uh, validated to, to be true. So, you know, this was a very powerful approach using, you know, Bayesian network vanilla, but the but the power in principle is that we can look at the data itself. We can look at each cell as an observation and try and learn these relationships from that. And now with all these new single cell genomics technologies and, and the droplet-based technologies and, and the ability to measure thousands and uh, now going on hundreds and thousands to millions of cells, we can actually really learn networks from the single cell data 
And we can even, you know, collect enough cells, 10,000 cells from a single patient, to learn patient-specific networks. So now I'm going to go all the way and, and, and move up uh, from um, 2005 to, to 2021 and give you a, a specific example in, in the clinic of, of, of some work that, that we've done. This is a collaboration uh, with Kathy Wu at the, the Dana-Farber Institute, um, led by Elham, who was a postdoc in, in my lab, now in, you know, independent faculty at uh, Columbia. And uh, basically, we wanted to, to be able to understand uh, the difference between responders to non-responders. This is like the canonical, most important thing that someone might want to understand. But you know, getting data from the clinic, I've, I've worked with cell lines, I've worked with mice. You know, the clinic is, is, is the messiest data to, to work with. There are so many confounding factors. Uh, a lot of these patients have different comorbidities, ate something different the breakfast before they came to get their sample. Uh, had different uh, uh, medical history, different drugs. Um, also, you know, you can't really control it. The, the, the patient is, is, is the first thing. So, you know, with mice, you can control it to optimize your uh, experiment with patients. You know, their comfort and, and, and medical uh, well being is, uh, you know, top priority, obviously. And, and that often impacts the way you can uh, collect uh, the samples in a very reproducible and controlled manner. So one of the most uh, important things to think about is your cohort is gonna have huge heterogeneity, both uh, biological because of the variety of different people, technical because of how the data was sampled. And the best thing you can do is try and get as good a clinical cohort as you can. Putting thought into uh, putting together a clinical cohort, for example, uh, prior therapy has a massive impact on the cancer. So if you can control for the prior therapy as much as possible, that's your chance of actually getting something out. Now, when you can combine um, good data that was well-preserved, a well-annotated, uh, coherent, uh, homogeneous as possible cohort and, and strong computation, you can do quite a bit. And in this case, we wanted to understand response to DLI. So these are uh, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia patients that had uh, a bone marrow transplant. Things looked good for a while and then they relapse. In these patients that relapse, one of the things that, that sometimes uh, you know, works for these patients is to reinfuse them with lymphocytes uh, from their donor. And that sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't. And we wanted to understand, well, how does this revive the immune system? And um, you know, what is the difference between the responders who you know, then you could see here in the plot, the tumor burden, this, this black to blue uh, orange line is tumor burden. In the good case, the tumor burden goes down and, and in the bad case, it, it continues to grow. We actually collected a, a, a pretty small cohort, uh, but what was important about it is it was high quality and it was longitudinal. And none of these patients had any prior therapy other than the, the, the you know, they all had the same uh, type of prior therapy history. And as references, at first we started, you know, normal healthy, and that was so far off left field that our, our references were people who had the, the transplant and, and never relapsed. And that worked a little bit better as a reference. So again, I cannot stress how, how messy clinical data is. And one thing that, you know, we haven't really solved, uh, you know, Fabian showed you this morning some, some uh, um, you know, uh, autoencoder based ways to, 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 to uh, integrate samples. And, and, and that's pretty nice, except that puts you in a Latin space, which you can't really get out of. Uh, you can't really translate it back to the genes uh, in a good, powerful way. And, and, and if you talk with biologists, if you put them in a latent space where they can't really interpret what's going on at the level of the genes, the biologists won't be happy. So if you don't want to use an autoencoder for your normalization, and even the autoencoders don't really work, how to normalize in a way that distinguishes between true biological differences between these patients and all the technical reasons why these samples are different, which are, are huge, is, is a real unsolved problem. And at first dot, this is a, a Tisney image and you see each dot is a cell colored by their patient ID. You see dramatically different uh, patient uh, IDs here um, and you see a lot of patterns. Now, if you look at it, you could give it an interpretation. The, these yellow cells are high in interferon. You might think this patient actually has biologically real high interferon. You can't know if it's technical or, or not. And you know, we do like uh, having uh, mixed therapy. This is the, the first 
large scale data set of uh, tumor infiltrating um, immune cells in, in patients. So we didn't even know what to expect when we first looked at it because cancers are actually very different. But what, one of the things that we now know is that the immune system should look quite different across patients and, and you want mixing. That is, if you look at the most similar cells to each cell, you want a lot of patients in, in that neighborhood. And when you see uh, immune cells that look this different, you know that you have an artifact that you have to fix. And, and there's no free lunch. None of these algorithms really uh, work perfectly. One of the algorithms that I really like in the case of patient data, this is sort of the strongest algorithm that, that's most biologically driven and its price is, you know, it's very messy to use and very heavy to use. So it's, it's it, you know, it doesn't scale well beyond 100,000 cells, but it really is based on the biology. And its key assumption is that gene-gene relationships, covariate relationships in the data, the same covariate relationship that allowed us to learn that Bayesian network before there, do represent real biology and that these gene gene relationships, you know, the, the, the covariance between genes is something that, that somehow survives these batch effects and the batch might impact the levels of individual genes, but that the relationship, you know, should be preserved and can somehow, you know, give you some inkling of a signal across these different batches and, and batch effects and, and that the batch effect uh, impacts genes rather than their relationship. So since we wanna learn covariate structure, basically we wanna model each cluster, each biological cell type as, as, as a multivariate log normal that represents the covariate relationships uh, that are present, that are important uh, in this cell type. And we assume that basically all the different clusters across all the different patients should have these same multivariate relationships. And we want to find some correction to the data that will uh, converge on these um, multivariate relationships, which we also learn uh, across the data a little bit messed up um, because of, of, of the batch. And this actually works incredi incredibly well. And as I said, it's computationally heavy, uh, you know, the direct opposite of, of these uh, autoencoders, which can scale to whatever number you want. Um, but they, they give you um, interpretable biology. They give you the gene gene, relationships that are driving the model. They give you the differentially expressed genes parametrically. They mix the, the patients very, very well. And at the end of the day, you see very strong signal for all the expected uh, immune cell types in, in the data. And I stress again, when you're working with real data, the immune cells should mix. And when you see that the immune cells aren't mixing well, you know there's a problem. But this covariation completely breaks in the tumors. And we do see that each tumor is its own beast. And you don't want to actually overcorrect these tumors because then you're actually normalizing against real biological variation. And, and that's one thing to be worried about because many people overcorrect, overnormalize, overpush samples that are biologically different to be the same. And so this is so powerful that we can take two different technologies. These are two patient cohorts collected you know, two years apart measuring, you know, one is the in drops, the other is 10X, one is measuring one side of the RNA, the three prime, the other is the five prime. Yet these covariate relationships are such a biological base fundamental entity that we found the near one to one matching across 34 specific T cells clusters across these two uh, patient cohorts because we are, we believe capturing something real. And even at the protein data, uh, we found this sort of same covariate relationships between entities. And so applying this to our data uh, to sort of really make sure that we account for all these variances in, in, in the T cells, we found 43 unique T cells. Now, I'm not going to tell you the, the, the entire story here that's, uh, you know, up in bioarchive, but I do want to tell you that now that we have these clusters, we can understand their relationship to treatment. We can see which ones are predictive of uh, response, which one dynamically change in the response, and so we actually used the Gaussian processing modeling to see which are the T cell subtypes, who, who are the ones that are responding to this therapy, which very, very specific T cell subsets are, are, are growing and expanding once you infuse them with the DLI. 
So we did this Gaussian process models with a little bit of adaptations to take into account the messiness of the data, the sizes of the clusters, the fact that some samples were really good, some samples, most of the cells died and we had very few of them in the freezer. So basically we had a prior to, to measure, okay, what do we expect if we have a really small cell population versus a large one? What do we expect when we have a real crappy sample? We don't wanna give it a lot of weight versus a sample that's really rich in cells. And so we encoded all this into our sort of uh, into our prior on the um, Gaussian process re uh, relationship, and, and we actually managed to learn these dynamics. And we found that terminally exhausted T cells, uh, they basically follow the tumor burden. They're actually predictive of whether you'll respond or not, but basically follow uh, the, the tumor burden. But these progenitor exhausted cells that start, you know, is very, very small populations very, very tiny uh, pre-therapy, uh, massively expand consistently across all the responder patients uh, across, um, you know, following therapy. And we see two specific different uh, progenitor exhausted uh, uh, clusters or cell types that, that have this expansion. So the, the tumor again is in, in, in gray and you see uh, as the tumor burden goes down after the therapy, which is the, the red line, uh, the, the growth in the size of this uh, uh, population. We see this occurring across all the responders in blue, but the non-responders, this isn't happening. The non-responders, the, the, the progenitor exhausted aren't changing. The terminally exhausted are just doing whatever they want. And, uh, you know, there's no relationship. So, you know, as I said, that we learned a lot about this from the data. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but, you know, the, the main question is the why and to go back to, to networks. And one of the most powerful uh, tools to try and learn networks in addition to RNA is ATAC-seq. Now we actually collected sorted ATAC-seq for these things. This was before the 10X uh, single cell attack uh, seq kick. And we really wanted to understand, okay, what is driving all these differences between responders to non-responders? You know, what's going on before and after therapy that causes this expansion of, of, of these cell types? And, and one of the main things we found is that the difference is, is predetermined. So before and after therapy, the epigenetic landscape was very, very similar. The big difference was um, between responders and non-responders. So the epigenetic landscape, a priori, was wired very differently between responders and non-responders. And basically, in the responders, they were populations that could respond. And they responded not by changing, but rather by expanding. And so to understand these networks, and this is work with Elham with a graduate student in my lab, Sandra, we actually tried to build a, a generative uh, process. So actually, you know, we had we we said, okay, the, the the ATAC peaks of each individual cell population, which remember at the time we had bulk. We also have a version that worked with single cell ataxy, where you don't have to do this deconvolution. But if you're working with bulk, uh, you know, we have we observe multiple replicates of bulk, but we want to deconvolve it into the uh, specific uh, regulatory networks in a cell type specific manner. The attack, the attack peaks serve as a prior for transcription factors that regulate targets. And so the ataxic peaks, the motifs serve as a prior to guide uh, a model for regulatory interactions and influences between transcription factors and their targets, which actually drive the observed covariate uh, structure in the data, uh, which, which we also wanna uh, estimate. And we can observe all this in the single cell data, which we can cluster and empirically measure these covariate relationships, which are part of a model. So the bottom row is, is observed and the top row is latent that we're trying to learn. And an important thing is that uh, the ataxic only serves as a prior. About half the transcription factors do not have a known motif and you can't, you don't, you can't even use ataxic to infer about them, many of them playing important roles. So we built a, a plate model with an EM Edward uh, implementation. And, and this is really a generative model that tries to mimic transcriptional uh, regulation. This model works beautifully. I mean, we, we benchmarked it in PBMCs where it sort of recapitulated all the known biology, but when we applied it um, to uh, this data, and, and particularly in the responders, we actually managed to pull out a lot of the canonical master regulators. These are TFs that have strong effects on all these very important immune checkpoint genes. And we saw completely different regulators for each of these different uh, cell types, the, the terminally exhausted that follow the tumor burden and the two progenitor exhausted that grow. Uh, we, we managed to recapitulate a lot of known biology 
including some poster child transcription factors such as TOX and TCS7. We found TOX right as it was actually being discovered elsewhere. And as we were finding TOX, suddenly lots of science and, and nature papers came out. And I stress TOX because it's an immunotherapy poster child for, for the, this response to immunotherapy. But this is one of these important transcription factors that does not yet have a motif. So if you really only limit to, to these motifs, you, you absolutely cannot learn what it's doing. And you can go all the way down to these patient uh, specific neural uh, the regulatory networks. Now, I'm not gonna bank, I, I do believe that the master regulators are captured because there's a very strong signal. They regulate a lot of genes. I'm not going to, you know, bank myself and bank, you know, uh, my 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 uh, my savings on each individual link here. But a lot of known links are are known, and and what I like about this is you can go to the data and see, you know, both uh, negative co-expression, negative regulation, positive regulation. You can actually look at the data that's supporting each one of these edges, and and many again known uh, edges were were found, and this is really exciting our immunotherapy friends because they actually see in these networks a lot of new targets and a lot of new avenues for new potential therapies and, and new ways to get this to work. And, you know, I know that, uh, you know, deep neural networks are, 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 are the thing to do these days, but I actually like uh, Bayesian graphical models because they lead to generative interpretive models. And if we want to understand the biology, it's critical to be able to interpret things. And we're not quite there in the autoencoders uh, for this type of thing. I'm actually working a little bit on how we can make them more interpretable. But for me, the interpretability is one of the most important features of a model. And of course, we can look at a validation cohort and see that in a completely new cohort, we see the same trends. We see even at the level of protein here, we threw in some site seek, all the canonical markers that made the immunologists happy were there at the level of the protein as well. The populations that we predicted should be expanding in uh, responders again uh, responded uh, and, and grew in, in a new cohort. And the same master regulators that, that we found previously, again, were the master regulators of the validation samples, showing that the robustness of the approach on a completely independent uh, new set of samples. So to recap, um, a lot of this sort of the manifolds that we saw earlier, the manifolds that, that Fabian showed you this morning, they're actually really driven at the bottom line. What creates these structure is gene-gene co-variation. And yes, gene-gene co-variation is nasty because it's computationally heavy, but it's an important uh, biological uh, entity. And using that, we can really try and understand what's happening at the level of individual patients and distinguish between responders and non-responders, as long as you sort of uh, treat clinical cohorts with a lot of care. Now, one of my favorite things about uh, single cell data, what, you know, what makes me, you know, my, my, my passion tick is the fact that, that these are asynchronous. So you can actually get dynamics from a single sample. If you take a single bone marrow out of, of, of a patient or out of a person, you get the entire uh, hematopoiesis. You get the early hematopoietic stem cells. You get all the progenitors and all the mature um, distinct uh, the immune types, the dendritic cells, the monocytes, the lymphocytes. And actually development is the first principal component of the data. We first noticed this in, in, in 2011, when even the first principal component of B cells looked something like B cell development. And you can get dynamics and regulation. If, if you know, you, you, like EMT, you get the epithelial state, the mesenchymal step, and every uh, stage in between really giving you the ability to uh, infer the regulators of the system. So again, um, a common way to represent these manifolds is, is with graphs. Each cell is a node connected uh, in edges to its most similar neighbors. So, you know, this is a low dimensional space and rather than working in the high dimensional Euclidean space, you work in the low dimensional geodesic space, sort of uh, traversing um, regions where you do have cell phenotypes, where cell states exist. If you wanna learn development, you have to go through a series of cells that, that are observed that, that actually exist. And as I said, I, I really like working with graphs because uh, they're computationally slower, but they, they leave me in a very um, interpretable domain. And so pseudo time, the ability to try and re recapitulate the uh, differentiation is, has been one of the most powerful uses of, of single cell data. And the idea is we're going to sort of order cells uh, if from a single sample uh, along a pseudo time of their developmental uh, maturity. 
And you know, we were able to get really accurate uh, progressions in the context of development and discover the order and timing of key events. And you know, the, the first uh, time we did this, 2014, we actually managed to find this tiny population right here. And the critical thing here is, again, we had to collect many cells because this population was very rare. It was seven in 10,000 cells. But in this population, a lot of important stuff happened. This is where the VDJ recombination is happening. This is when the B cell receptor is, is shuffling, when the DNA you know, gets messed up. And right in these cells, there's an active signaling checkpoint. So in the cells right before them, nothing's happening. This checkpoint, the signaling event is very specific to this tiny population. And to give you a feel for how tiny this population is, it's that little red sliver here expanded into a circle and population three right here, the smallest pie uh, out of this tiny sliver. And really uh, to get this population, we had to have very accurate algorithms and collect a lot of cells. Uh, this is why we really are pushing for so many cells in single cell RNA-seq. And this is the population that goes awry in pediatric leukemia. This is the, the, the population, this is the checkpoint that gets messed up there. And by knowing normal biology, by understanding normal development, we could finally understand pediatric leukemia, but we had to identify this rare cell type uh, to do so. And it's often in biology that the rare population is the one that matters. And a lot of machine learning turns to the average and, and sort of actually ignore, ignores these rare events, which I found to be most important in, in biology. So going on in you know, circa you know, more modern, just instead of finding a, a linear trajectory, we can actually try and understand development and fate potential, uh, modeling fate uh, probabilities uh, as, as a Markov chain. So we have an undirected neighbor graph. We can use pseudo time to orient it and we get a, a directed graph, uh, which we can use to build a, a Markov chain and then get all the, the access to all the math and tools and, and, and power of a, of a Markov chain. But again, when you're building these things, a lot of times, you know, in these talks, people tell the big picture. And yes, here we built a Markov chain. It seems very uh, simple. But one of the things I've experienced in computational biology, it's the, you know, the devil's in the details. It's all the small details of how exactly do you build the cell-cell similarity? How do you sort of sample this graph properly? And one important thing to know about these, these manifolds is that they're very non-uniform. You have about five orders of magnitude between uh, um, frequencies of, of cell types. And while many algorithms assume a uniform density on these manifolds, including the famous UMAP algorithm, they're very non-uniform. And as I've stressed, sometimes it's actually the rare populations that are more, more uh, most Im important. It's certainly the rare populations that are driving these transitions. So we have a min-max sampling algorithm that really tries to cover the, the entire manifold. And, and really covering these rare populations effectively is critical for any success. Once you've constructed your, 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 your Markov chain with a little bit of thought, then you, know, you could use the full power and, and you, have, uh, you, you make the terminal states as absorbing states and you have all of the cl closed form solution of linear um, algebra and powering the matrix. And, and one of the things, uh, and now we can for each cell, uh, in a closed form solution, predict its probability of uh, resulting in each terminal fate. And I really like watching algorithms in action. I think it gives a lot of uh, intuition. So this is the original Markov graph where every row and, and column is a cell and uh, the dots represent uh, the edge strength. And this is the original graph. And as you power the matrix, you can take longer and longer paths, uh, getting to farther and farther away states and have the probability of reaching each of the terminal states after 50 steps, 500 steps, and as this sort of uh, converges in closed form. And you can get for each cell, this is the probability of each terminal fate, as well as the plasticity, how uncertain, how plastic it is to reach all these different uh, end states uh, from this sort of mark of chain, the structure, the process of, of development, cell fate choice, differentiation, is all encoded into the graph structure, into the Markov graph. And, and you can make a lot of inferences using simple linear algebra. And you know, it sounds simple, but it's actually an incredibly flexible framework because there's a lot of knobs that we can play with. We can change the feature and the way we um, measure the similarity matrix, choosing biologically uh, meaningful genes. We can you know, look at the epigenetic marks, which I showed you how effective they were in that first application in the CML. And we could change the ways the edges are oriented. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that 
We don't have to use just pseudo time. For example, we can use genetic mutations and their accumulation in the cancer case. And so applying this to, to a case of early development, this is the developing embryo. It's actually a mouse embryo. And this is the, you know, the very first lineage decision a developing embryo makes between embryonic and extra embryonic cells. Now, the fact that we can take the cells and order them so accurately along pseudo time, we can see what changes and, and, and what happens to these cells as they're making a fate choice between two of the earliest lineages, we can see how the major regulators in the cells are changing along this pseudo time and actually figure out that, that what needs to happen, this dotted line is the probability to go to the PRE lineage. So when, when it chooses the PRE limited, uh, lineage, what happens is a combinatorial regulation of these two uh, receptors. So when you have this combinatorial uh, play of these two receptors, the cell is driven towards the PRE lineage, which we could validate in imaging. We can also discover some really surprising things. So here again is that high entropy area when it's trying to decide whether it's embryonic or extra embryonic. And then it makes the decision and everything seems fine, but we actually found another surprising region of high entropy where it seems that cells that had be decided to become epiblast decided to become embryonic in pattern and be part of the body, change their mind and become extra embryonic and, and serve as the placenta and the yolk sac and all these other uh, embryo extrinsic features. And that was the, pal uh, the, 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 the palantir's prediction and everyone thought, well, uh, um, the biologists didn't really believe us. They thought it was artifacts. We went in, we did all the you know, due diligence of saying, you know, how strong is the signal? How much do we believe in it? We said we believe in it. The biologists went back in, used some lineage tracing and some uh, uh, Crelock systems, two different systems to really validate uh, our algorithm's prediction and, and, and discovered you know, a really novel trans differentiation, early de development. And actually this worked together with Katagen Tanakis, um, you know, really rewrote uh, the, the, the developmental biology textbook on, on five uh, major findings. Now we can apply this not only to genes, as I said, we can change the features. This is work actually by Prisca Liberali. And here the features are actually imaging, they're organoids. It's, it's not individual cells, it's entire organoids, their shape, their size, their symmetry breaking, the number and ways in which they break the asymmetries. And so you can extract these features from the image, but some of the features are actually uh, protein expression. So this is a way where you, and this is the exact same algorithm. The only thing we're doing is changing the features which we feed it in. The only thing we're doing is sort of changing how the graph is constructed. And now we can uh, connect protein expression, in this case, the app one with symmetry breaking and actually see what is the protein, what is the factor that's driving this, this phenotypic outcome of the symmetry breaking in, in the organoid, showing you how powerful of a biological discovery tool this very simple concept of a Markov chain is. Now, getting the right orientation is a really important thing here. And so uh, one really popular method to, to orient graphs to try and get a, a handle into causality, because all the classic pseudo time methods make a really strong assumption of cells go from less mature to more mature, uh, you have to know what the starting point is. And, and it's a very strong assumption that the cells go forward in development. And we know that's not always the case, for example, in the case of regeneration. So here we're using the ratio between unspliced mRNA, which comes first to spliced mRNA to try and get causality. And this has been really powerful. And you see these very beautiful of the data, but actually they're very, very smooth and, and smoothed out two dimensional representations of the data. And it's actually smoothed on two dimension to look nice can be very misleading. In fact, take with a grain of salt, anything in two dimensions because two dimensions can often mislead what's happening in the higher dimensionality. And when you look in the higher dimensionality, you see these uh, velocity vectors can change even across neighboring similar states and point all over the direction and point outside the manifold into directions that are impossible for cells to go. They're actually really, really noisy. So together with Fabian from this, from this morning, um, you know, and led by, you know, a great student in his lab that visited my lab, Marius, we decided to marry the best of both worlds. 
Palantir, the Markov change, the, the graph manifold, the idea that this graph manifold really captures the sort of legal possible regions of cell states and give you a global structure to the data. And these local velocities, which locally give you some inkling uh, of causality, some inkling of, of direction. And by marrying the two together and simply saying, okay, if we're going to direct our Markov chain, we're gonna give higher priority to, to, to directions that align with, with the velocity, uh, but we're gonna put it in the context of our Markov chain uh, we're going to actually also use the expression, particularly for areas where this is noisy, and we're going to look at it globally and look at longer, more global trends using sort of the Markov chain. And you get the sort of best of both worlds constraining uh, your, your progress through the phenotypic manifold. And again, um, a lot of the devils is in the detail, not only in the modeling assumptions, but in, in the math uh, to try and get these approximations done well. A very important part of cell rank is, 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 is actually using uh, general raw appearance cluster cluster analysis to get a coarse graining, which helps both in accuracy and in speed to take these very, very high resolution single cell uh, transition matrices to get sort of metastable states to really understand the dynamics of the system and automatically infer initial and terminal states. You know, in biology, we don't always have a, a case of ground truth. And it's really great when you can find ground truth. Here is a case of cell tagging of a reprogramming uh, in vitro experiment where cells are tagged in a, such a way that we know the progeny of each cell. So we, over the days, we can see which cells are progeny of which cells, which cells uh, have the same cell tag. And during the reprogramming, um, many of the cells succeed and get to the endoderm lineage. This is success. And, and cell rank uh, automatically identified the initial state, the success state, and other cells reach dead end. Now, if you look at these two dimensional velocities and it looks really you know, good, it looks like there's signal in the data, these velocities are all wrong and all misleading. There's no path to success and we know a lot of cells succeed and there seems to be a path from success to a dead end, which is biologically incorrect. But when we applied the cell rank, which you know overcomes all this by, by looking at low long range structures, we could actually predict very correctly. We could take um, um, cell clones and ask, okay, where's their progeny gonna go? Are these uh, progeny gonna succeed or fail? And we see a very, very high accuracy of cell ranks predictions and the accuracy gets obviously better and better and better as we go closer to the end point, as we go further into the reprogramming state. But, you know, even, um, 14 days before the reprogramming ends, we have a pretty accurate prediction uh, of 82% accuracy. Now, a lot of people like these in vitro systems because in, in vitro systems, you can actually build a ground truth. But I have to warn you that in vitro systems are always much, much, much simpler than, than, uh, than real biological in vivo tissue. And there's a lot of algorithms that work beautifully in in vitro and have wonderful behavior. And you sort of get the idea that these algorithms are working really, really great, but they've been optimized to the simplicity of in vitro and they completely break in in vivo. So you have to sort of be aware of that and not trust, uh, not do everything in vitro, even though it's appealing because it has a ground truth because it's just far more simple in its sort of behavior distribution, um, and if you optimize an algorithm to something too simple, it's gonna break when, when life gets complicated. So I like testing things also in the in vivo setting in cases where it's harder to find uh, cases where, where the ground truth is known. Here, this is a well-known system of pancreas development and people know where each of these progenitors are supposed to, to go because they've been solved through very careful biology. But here cell rank uh, automatically uh, finds the path to these delta cells, automatically uh, identifies uh, these progenitor cells, and even identifies the, the key driving regulators underlying uh, delta cell identity. And this signal completely doesn't exist in regular velocity. So you really need the marriage of both of them. We also tested this in regeneration. And this is a place where Palantir miserably fails because it's the differentiation. Here, cell rank predicted uh, uh, um, regeneration, a de-differentiation from goblet cells to basal cells. This is going the opposite way from more mature cells to less mature cells. So 
you know, regular pseudo time would break here. And we also predicted all these intermediate stages that these go through. And this was sort of validated to, to some degree in imaging. And this is new, not only in the de-differentiation, but going forward, basal cells always go through club cells. There's no direct path between forward between basal and goblet cells, but we found a sort of interesting reverse de-differentiation because velocity uh, did not predetermine uh, the direction of where we're going and cell rank could go the backward uh, direction here. But again, velocity, as I said, is an automatic magic bullet. It could be incredibly misleading. Splicing dynamics really depends. First of all, if you're out, the, out of the eight hour window, a lot of people try and use it in like two, four week uh, windows of development and cancer, that's not gonna work. You have to sort of really understand what are the assumptions of your system, where something can work, where something can't work. Velocity has a time limit, it's about eight hours. Uh, there are systems which simply don't have enough introns in them to capture good enough velocity. Where all the master regulators, all the important regulators of the process, all the drivers of the process, don't have any splice reads for the, for the algorithm to, to get a grip on. Hematopoiesis is one of these things. Hematopoiesis is where, you know, velocity goes systematically wrong. And while cell rank can make some corrections, when things are systematically wrong, when velocity is completely off, even cell rank uh, can't save it. So here we actually developed a new approach. Again, uh, back to the regulatory velocity. Here's Cassandra again, my, my graduate student. And uh, she said, okay, let's actually use uh, regulation itself, the idea that transcription factors precede their targets to actually get these velocities. So here we wanna you know, model, um, just use a regulatory model to, 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 to build these velocities. And we go uh, with a linear, we know that it's, you know, a linear is an, a, 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 a simplification, but it's robust. It has a closed form solution. We can build sort of a genome wide model um, and now if, if, if we have this model, uh, we can actually use regulation and our model for regulation to predict a future uh, cell fate given the transcription factors and the regulatory models of, of, of the current state. And of course you need to learn the regulatory um, system. You need to learn which TFs regulate which targets and how, and you wanna sort of learn this from the data, but you have two unknowns. You don't know the, the, the slopes of the velocities and you don't know this regulatory matrix. So that's where you know, EM comes in when you have two unknowns. And of course, EM really needs good constraints and a good starting point to su succeed. And I'm not going to go into all these details, but rather show that it really works. This gets hematopoiesis you know, quite accurately. And you, you, it works not only at the global level of velocities, but you can also look at what each individual gene is doing and all the genes that, that we care about as cells are making a decision uh, in this case, between megacarocytes and erythrocytes, the right genes are going up and down. And we can try and understand this, uh, the behavior going all the way back to the regulatory models and looking at who are the activators and who are the repressors that are driving this observed behavior. And again, we get a lot of correct inferences here. Not everything in the entire global model is correct, but there's enough uh, things that are correct that at least get the global dynamics of the system correct. And one of my favorite things here is that we can do an ablation experiment, an in silico ablation experiment and ask, which are the master regulators? Which are the real regulators that are really driving these cell fate changes that we care about? And for example, for hematopoiesis, we managed to correctly predict the most important regulators. And you know, they're not necessarily the highest expressed ones, but what we've actually computed their impact on, on the targets and really shown that when you knock out this regulator and remove it from the model, there's a huge change in, in the behavior and the velocities. And you know, we can try and actually map this um, and we're applying this in the cancer setting. And here we have a um, rapid autopsy where we have multiple samples from the same deceased uh, uh, individual, multiple primary samples of the tumor as well as multiple METs from the same individual, including three separate liver METs, which is the closest thing you're gonna get in a biological replicate. And here we also see these transitions, these continuums from a metastatic, from a primary to metastatic state and sort of different paths to metastasis, which we're learning. 
So to recap, you know, um, this, these Markov changes, these trajectories, this ability to get regulation from the data is really powerful to understand how biology works and what's driving these things. If you know what's driving these things, you can potentially, for example, stop metastasis in its tracks. But sometimes actually the simplest of things uh, work best. Here's a case of leptomeningeal metastasis where we went to the clinic and got data. And this is a really horrible disease because the, the patients suffer. There's a lot of uh, physiological effects, which is why these things are, are removed and we can actually look at them and assay them and survival is 3.5 months and, and there's nothing to do. And here, actually the simplest of things, clustering and differential uh, expression analysis got the answer. And we saw that actually um, these two um, regulators um, for, for iron transport get overexpressed in the cancer cells, even though they're only expressed in immune cells in normal, in every single patient, in leptomeningeal metastasis driven by breast, in leptomeningeal metastasis driven from a primary lung tumor. And this gave us a new therapeutic approach that's going into patients under six months from data to clinic. See, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna go really, really, what, what we learned here is cell-cell interactions really matter. So the future is really imaging. Uh, this is a great technology which allows us to look at an, a complete lymph node, but actually creating the images is pretty hard because multiplex data is complex. Um, there's a lot of uh, damage to the tissue. So when you realign it and try and get the high single cell resolution, these uh, little things are supposed to align. They're all supposed to be on the cell surface and you see that they have moved, that they move differently in different parts of the tissue. So no, no single transformation can fix it. It's not a simple linear transformation. So this finally is where I think deep AI works and we've developed our own little uh, learning net method which we call spirit to realign these tissues perfectly, getting a perfect picture of the lymph. And now we can actually look at these interactions and learn these histomat modules at multicellular scale. We can recognize automatically the germinal center which has very different cells and cell interaction. And even within the germinal center, we see additional structure and at another scale, different regions. Here we see a region, the B cells are in blue and they are proliferating in yellow. So we see these are the B cells that are growing and preparing antibody, perhaps after you got a COVID vaccination and, and you see this sort of proliferating region and all the cells and the control T cells around it in, in, blue, in, in, in cyan. And here just next to it is a completely different region where the B cells in, in blue are not proliferating. And that's because we have a regulatory T cell in red here inhibiting. Of course, inhibition is critical. Otherwise our immune system would go on, out of control. And you know, this is again, a very early work in progress, but you know, the future really is now going into these tissue contexts with imaging. And that's where I actually think a lot of the um, deep neural network approaches will be very powerful and, and can help interpret it and so in summary, you know, single cells really allow us to understand the system, understand the biology, the transitions, the regulation. If you understand that, you can know where to interfere. And, and of course, the next frontier is, is, is space where there's a lot of work to do. So this is work by a lot of people in, in, in my lab, a lot of great colleagues at MSKCC uh, and uh, elsewhere, you know, particularly Kathy and, and, and Dana Farber uh, Kat locally, Sasha, who I'm doing the imaging with, and a lot of great members from the lab, again, highlighting Ilham, Manu, who's also now independent faculty at uh, Fred Hutch and Cassandra and Doron, who are uh, graduate students in my lab, and, and thank you for your attention. And thank you for this uh, very inspiring talk and this excellent overview over the, the challenges and possibilities of, of single cell research. Thank you very much. We send a round of applause to you virtually. Now, time for questions. Are there questions from within our network? Please raise your hand. If so, if not, I go directly to the um, YouTube uh, questions from the YouTube audience. Uh, there's one question here. The DLI example. How did you find the correct number of clusters of temporal patterns? So basically, okay, there, there, there's, couple steps to it. The clustering was done by, by Biscuit and Biscuit automatically finds the right number of clusters based on the right number of sort of 
densities it, it finds in there, of course, automatically is, is, is a cheat because it all depends on the prior and the tuning of the parameters, but you know, it, 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 it pretty much converges and we see that each of the clusters are, are, are quite distinct and, and separable and have their own uh, differentially expressed gene and their own covariate cluster. And the fact that we see the same clusters in different cohorts for reproducing, you know, gives me some idea that those are good clusters. Now, many of these clusters are actually really small. So again, I skipped over a lot of the details so really to match clusters and to get sizable clusters, we actually went to meta clusters and sort of clustered very similar clusters and then used those in our dynamic model. So that, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to learn. You know, clustering is, is imperfect. T cells are continuum. The border is import perfect. The data is noisy. So learning dynamics of tiny, tiny, tiny clusters that are small, small fraction of the data it is hard, so we pulled a bit here. And uh, again, we, 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 we had very strong priors on the fact that uh, our measurements aren't very accurate in order to be able to get those mm -hmm. dynamics. And when we did all that, uh, you know, the dynamics were clear and reproducible and importantly reproduced across multiple patients. Thank you for that answer. De Giovanni from the, our network, one PhD student in our network has a question. Giovanni, please. Hi, thank you. First of all, it was really fascinating talk. I have a somewhat practical question since you mentioned a few times the comparison with uh, neural networks and that type of machine learning. Uh, what I wanted to ask is how scalable are these methods and how much data do you need to get good results? For example, I know this decade in which you uh, applied it to a set of six patients, which for other methods might be very uh, not a very big sample size. So again, each method is, is very different. The, the, the Bayesian uh, graphical model methods uh, scale to the order of uh, 100,000 cells. Um, and, and as you can see, that, that was sufficient to learn something. Uh, the sort of graph-based approaches and the Markov chain-based approaches uh, can scale to the low millions, especially if you do computational tricks. Cell rank actually has a lot of uh, computational tricks. And again, we use the sampling in Palantir as one computational trick, and we, we use the coarse graining in cell rank as another. So, you know, that, that scales to min millions. The, the, the cell to cell similarity computation is the uh, painful um, part of the process. But again, there are all sorts of tricks to make that quicker. Now, I do want to stress that usually when you have six patients, it doesn't cut it, okay? That, that was um, a combination of, 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 of luck and good choice. And that's why I stress getting a good cohort. We have often cohorts that are even bigger. And biology depends on the strength of your signal and, and how, um, you know, how pure your cohort is. When I work with mice and they're genetically the same and they're grown in the same cage and I can sort of really have a true biological replicate, yeah, five and five are enough for responders and not responders. That's a big effect size. In patient cohorts, the reason that we could succeed is because all these patients had the same treatment history and were treated by the same drugs. The moment you have heterogeneity in the past drug treatments of patients, your success and, and homogeneity goes out the window. So the moment you can't get a cohort that, that shared a treatment history uh, and has sort of some equivalence in the way that they were treated, your ability to learn anything from that is out the window and actually curating such patient cohorts is, is, uh, is really hard. And kudos for, for Pavan for, for searching, you know, through the entire DFCI biobank for, for such a curated data set. Thank you. Thank you for this, the answer. There's another question from the YouTube audience. Clinical time series analysis. How did you deal with having not matched different time points per patient? Would your approach also work on bulk data? So, um, I, two questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so the Gaussian process, one of the reasons we went with the Gaussian process is, is because it's, you know, by, by, by nature, can handle uh, not matched, uh, and because because it sort of puts time as, as one of its uh, you know uh, variables. And if I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'll, I'll quickly reshare the screen. 
and, and show that the, that, 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 that the time really were not matched. So we did make sure that our cohort had one match time point and you know, right before therapy and an approximately matched time point in, in, in sort of number of days after therapy. Not perfect, this is patience, but close. But for the time series, you could see that the, the rest of the samples, um, you know, we had a time series, but in all sorts of weird time points, uh, sort of the, 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 the um, x-axis is time. And the Gaussian process exactly handled uh, the non-matched. But obviously uh, there's a couple of important points, getting something, you know, close before DLI, I think was very, very uh, important for, for success here. Um, you know, the question about bulk data. Um, I just think that single cell data is so powerful. You know, yes, I had only five patients, but I had, uh, you know, 80,000 cells. I had 80,000 data points from which to learn these networks. I could break it down, you know, for example, uh, the progenitor exhausted cells uh, that were the ones that grew under the response, they would be completely drowned out in bulk. They're a tiny part of the population even the terminally exhausted cells that predicted response to therapy are a relatively small proportion of the population. So I wouldn't have been able from bulk to see very strong. That's a signal of the, the predictive, yes, the terminally exhausted actually was seen in bulk, but certainly the progenitor exhausted, the responding populations, understanding the response, uh, I would not have been able to do from bulk. And, uh, and for me, yes, Getting patient samples is hard. It's a lot of work. It's very, a lot of clinical trials only have 30 patients in the clinical trial, even if you have all the money and resources in the world. And so the, the one place where you can get more information is looking at a lot of cells. And that's why I love single cell. Thank you. I have one technical question. Namely, you mentioned uh, correctly that details matter in the construction of these graphs. And, uh, but the first thing you mentioned was this uh, cell cell a kernel. How about the, the parameters of the actual um, neighborhood graph construction? Like how many neighbors do you connect like one cell yeah. to? What is your threshold in, cut in cutting so, off similarity? First of all, because details matter, I'm a stickler yeah. uh, to writing really long and detailed um, supplemental. I, I, I really get pissed when people like hack that. So yeah. anything I told you that's published is, is, you know, all the gory details are in these like 80 page supplemental documents. In fact, my lab laughs at me for the type of supplements I demand of them. Yeah. Uh, and they, they call it, you know, there's peer review and peer review, which is much worse. That's my <laughs> view. Um, but um, specifically, as I said, the cell density is what matters and you want to unify the cell density. So if you want to get fine structure, you want K of the original graph to be rather small. So mm -hmm. you, you, you really want to be able to find these fine structures. But of course you need K large enough so that the graph will be connected. If you have a disconnected graph, then, then, then you're screwed. So we try and look for a fairly small K that one keeps the graph connected and also is pretty robust. So anything we do, we always show that the that we get the same response for multiple parameters. If the parameter really mattered and we get a different res response, we don't feel that's robust. So we also show that the particular choice of K didn't matter. So the moment you get a K that's large enough to keep the graph, graph connected and mm -hmm. large enough to keep that's your response your response robust. So if you sort of have a good range of Ks, nothing happens that's the, the K you want to get for your K and N graph. And then because, you know, this is a um, Gaussian kernel and you, you, you don't want these cell densities where these dominant nodes that have dense regions to com like completely control the graph. You want the graph fairly uniform. You say, okay, I want K. So for each node, I'm going to take a Sigma for the Gaussian kernel that will give me approximately K neighbors. And it's an adaptive kernel giving me, you know, an approximately K neighbor sigma neighborhood for each cell, depending on its local density. And again, that K keeps the graph connected and the results robust. And that's the way we, we, uh, we generally do it. But th these details, some, they're, they're slightly different in some of the different papers, but all that is in, in, in gory detail of what and why we did in each supplement. Thank you. I'll repeat one more question that Fabian was asked this morning, namely by someone else, not by me, but 
uh, the question was, what is or what will be the, the first clinical application of single cell technology? Well, you know, I think that I've shown you an example. I mean, yeah. right now, I know of at least um, seven clinical tr trials that have been already driven, that, that people have found new targets and new combination therapies from single shell. I showed one example with the iron uh, binding yep. of, of leptomeningeals. I have two more of these in, 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 in MSK. Uh, Aviv Regev has about three of these where she found, uh, you know, uh, new uh, approaches, new therapeutic targets, new combination therapies. Nira Cohen, I know, has one of them. So this is a very powerful method to sort of getting new targets, new combination therapies, new molecular targets, new treatments. Um, and I'm, I'm expecting that that will expand. So it, the, we're, we're past the, the first. Yes, yes, uh, exactly. That's why I didn't say will be, but is or is or has been, yeah. Good. Again, I, you can really understand what's going yeah. on, why something is happening, what's the best place to target it, what cell yeah. type it needs to be targeted in when you look at it at this resolution. And this is how you discover new therapies. Exactly. A very exciting topic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dana, we all enjoyed it very much. Um, we're very happy that you took the time to, to speak here and that we learned more about machine okay. learning and, and its role in single cell. Uh, okay. Thank you very much.